Did you know it is very important that you read the introduction to any Bible or study Bible? They say in their stuff that you would never find in the rest of the Bible. Would you like to peel away the layers and find out what's even in the introduction to King James Bibles? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. People have loved to see the 1611 King James Bible. When the new King James came out, this was printed by Thomas Nelson to show people what the original 1611 was like and compare it to their new King James. They had their own reasons. I'm not going to go into them for now. But suffice to say, it was a really good representation in Roman type as opposed to Gothic type, like the Declaration of Independence and, and stuff like that. It was an easy to read type. Word for word, letter for letter. There's no problem with that. But as the 400th year anniversary of the King James 2011 started to roll around, publishers started to go, well, we want to go back and get ourselves a, a reprint of the King James and publish it. So let me ask you a question. If you're a publisher, you sell multiple Bibles, and this is just another one of them, how could you possibly mess up a simple thing like copying a 1611 King James Bible that's already been published in the past? Answer, add a new introduction. So this one right here is almost identical to this one. This is 2003, but this is 2010. And in this one, they added a special introduction called a publisher's preface. It says the version of 1611, 1911, to 2011, from the 300th to the 400th anniversary, see? But when we go a couple pages in, where do they make the focus? Like the previous ones talking about the history of the Bible of the King James and its effect on people, etc.? Oh no. It says, some major editions of the English Bible, 1881 to 2011. 1881? Yeah. Because it says, in here, starting right out, among the reasons for scholars to propose a new translation of the Bible, two stand out. Changes in the common language and advances in biblical scholarship. So now we're scholars, everything's great, we have advances, and so that we can change the Bible. But let me ask you this. When Jesus was on this earth, and he was in the synagogue, and he opens up the scroll, did he say, you have heard that it was written, but there's a better way to say that now. Or... Did he look at those words and say, wait a second, that's not what I said. This is what I said to Isaiah. Neither one of those is true. Because that copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy was still God's words. God, according to his promise, preserved his words. In the same way, we have them in English preserved in the King James Bible. If God did it right once, why do it again? Let's see where he goes with this. But there have been major advances in biblical scholarship in the nearly three centuries since the KJV had first been published. Time doesn't have anything to do with it. I just showed you that. Most radical was the adoption of Westcott and Hort's Greek New Testament in place of the Erasmian text. What's the Erasmian text? I thought it was the preserved Bible through the centuries brought into English in the King James. But now they're making it like Erasmus just made it up. Erasmus, who went from place to place, from library to library, learning what the scriptures actually said and being able to fix those things out. That's what Martin Luther read in Greek and in Latin, and that's what started to lead to what we call the Protestant Reformation. Praise God for God's secret agement, Erasmus. Okay? So let's go on. Then it said, because Westcott and Hort's work was based on much older Greek manuscripts than those available to Erasmus, oh, here it comes out, older is better. Then it says that there were thousands of differences. And then it goes to say most of them are spelling and a little word here or there. There are some differences there. But then it goes on to say, listen to the weird words here. However, the majority of biblical scholars and the rest of the church have a come to agree with the general opinion that the older Greek manuscripts are closer in time. That's one opinion. And second, and content to the original New Testament. So they're also more accurate. By opinion. Notice that? 
and that, another opinion, no major doctrine of the church is lost due to variations between these manuscripts and those available to the KJV translators. I got over a hundred videos. Take a look for yourself. There's a lot of differences and a lot of doctrines are affected. Then it goes into the revised version and the new revised standard. And then it says the revised version didn't displace the KJV. Displace meaning set aside as the preferred Bible of the English speaking church. But it did open the doors for a flood of new Bible translations into the 20th century. I didn't say it. He said it. Flood. That was the devil's purpose, to give us a flood to try to displace, move out of its place, God's holy words in English, the King James. And then he mentions the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, the New American Standard. Oh, and by the way, he called them official ecumenical translations. Ecumenical. Let me translate that. One world Bible for one world religion. That's in why they changed the Bible. You can see it later. Anyway, it goes on into today's English version and the NIV. Imagine that. And the New King James. What does Westcott and Hort and the new manuscripts have to do with the New King James? I thought it was just an update of the language. Hmm. Then the Living Bible, the New Living Translation, the message. And then it says this. There were significant Catholic translations of the 20th century, the Jerusalem Bible of 1966, and then it goes on to the New Jerusalem and the New American Bible of 1970, and then use these words. Of course, these fine Roman Catholic translations did nothing to displace the KJV in Protestant churches. One, they shouldn't, and two, why are you calling the Whore of Babylon's translations fine? Displace, displace. Then it says, how did this explosion of new translations affect the KJV? Well, it didn't do a thing to it. It's still right here, see? But they said that first they used the translations alongside each other, but after a while, people started buying more of the other translations and the King James sales went down. Now, you know that people who actually read the Bible read more King James's than any other. That's in another vlog. But... They're pointing out sales. Here he goes on to say this. By 1986, the NIV, here it is again, had surpassed the KJV in new Bible sales and remained the best-selling English translation, followed by the King James, the Living Bible, and the uh, New King James. Wow. So what they're really trying to do is say this. There are lots of wonderful translations available. You should consider them instead of this one, like the NIV. All right, who is this guy anyway? It's John R. Kohlenberger III. That's the guy who edited my NIV Hebrew English Greek Old Testament. In fact, that's like the NIV go-to guy. What's he doing writing an introduction to a King James Bible? Well... They were getting ready for the NIV 2011, 400 years after the 1611. They set that up to make it the replacement for the King James. So let me recap. Number one, always read introductions. They tell you things the rest of the Bible uh, in the verses and the other sections will never tell you. Number two, um, God doesn't need to do anything twice. He did it once. It was perfect the first time. He never needs to do it a second time. Third, you can trust the text of your King James Bible, but anything else that's not text, not the actual words of God, isn't. It's man's words. And fourth, why would anyone settle for man's words instead of God's? I'm just sticking with God's words, the King James Bible, whether in 1611 or my brand new copy. That is God's words, and those words I can trust. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.